Here we're going to be talking about the electron configuration of the transition metals. And these are going to be a little trickier than some of the other electron configurations we've been doing because there's a few rules that we need to remember. Much of what was special about transition metals has to do with half-filled and filled subshells. We've talked about three main types of subshells, S, P, and D, and it's kind of important to remember what's half-filled and whole-filled because these are uh, particularly stable. So for an S subshell, a half fill would be one and whole filled would be two. So we're just putting in there, this really doesn't come into play that often, but it's important to just consider it. For a P subshell, half filled would be three and whole filled would be six. So remember a P subshell can hold on to six electrons. Kind of the important one is that a D subshell can hold 10 if wholly filled and half filled is only five. So we're gonna find there's a couple of places where this pops up, the stability of half filled and whole filled subshells. And this is one of them. So when you're doing electron configurations and you see that you're dealing with a transition metal, you have to remember that 3D4 and 3D9 are special. So we'll look at those here in just a second. And the reason why is, 3D4 is one electron away from being half filled, and 3D9 is one electron away from being wholly filled. And they want that stability of being either half or whole filled so much that they will actually steal an S electron. So they will steal one of the four S electrons to become 3D5, or in the, uh, the other case, 3D10. And what this is going to do is reduce the number of S electrons. So just remember 3D4 and 3D9 are special because they're one electron away from being half filled and whole filled. And what's going to happen is an S electron is going to jump from the 4S subshell into the 3D subshell to allow our electron configuration to either be half filled or whole filled. So let's look at some examples. So the electronic configuration for calcium here, so we're gonna start off, remember we back up until we get to a noble gas core, which is argon, we move forward. This is our 4S subshell. So it, calcium has a full 4S subshell. So that's the electron configuration. Then when we add one more electron, we start going into the 3D subshell. So canadium has only one electron in there. So we get uh, an electronic configuration of 4S2, 3D1. Just really quickly, because of a fact that actually the 4S electrons are lower in energy than 3D, sometimes textbooks will tell you to reverse them. So sometimes they will say 3D1 and 4S2. So I've seen textbooks do it either way. There's a reason for both of them, uh, and this will come up and be more important when we start removing electrons from transition metals to make cations. I prefer to just keep it straight so that it follows the linearity of the periodic table. So here we go from argon, this is 4s, and then this is 3d. So this will become more important when we start forming transition metal cations. Okay, so when we go on to vanadium, now vanadium has 3d electrons, just straight counting like we've done. Where it gets weird is when we get to chromium. So here, this would normally would be 3D4, and it wants to be a 3D5 so bad that it will actually steal a 4S electron. So without doing the change, you would expect it to be 4S2, 3D4. To gain the stability of the half-filled subshell, you would think the electron configuration was 4S2, 3D4, but to gain the stability of a half-filled subshell, an electron will jump from the 4S subshell into the 3D subshell making it 4s1 3d5 so just remember the two numbers that you need to remember that is four and then nine so when we continue on when we add a couple more electrons everything goes back into the normal electron configurations we've been doing so here when we look at iron irons right here on the periodic table we backtrack argon 4s2 we start putting electrons into the 3D subshell. We put one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in there. So once we get past D4, it goes right back to just counting electrons and putting them into a subshell until we get to copper, which it would be 3D9. However, just like chromium, it's going to grab onto an S electron to gain a full subshell. So 
Without the change, it would be 4S2 3D9, but to gain the stability of having a full 3D subshell, it's going to grab one of these 4S electrons to become 3D10. So copper uh, has an electron configuration of argon, noble gas core, 4S1 3D10. And we're going to see some evidence of this uh, later on when we do form cations with transition metals that actually copper can form a plus one charge because it can lose this 1S electron. Many of the other transition metals tend to form plus two charges. After that, when we get to zinc, we have 10 3D electrons, so we don't need to steal zinc. Its electron configuration is argon, 4S2, 3D10. And then when you go past that, so here we're putting in one more electron. After you go past 3D10, now we're back into the P block. So if we look at gallium now, backtrack argon, 4S2, that's filled 3D10. So we filled our D subshell, and then now we are at the N equals 2, 3, 4P subshell, and we've put one electron into that. So once we filled up our D subshell, we get back into the P subshell, and we start adding electrons to there.